Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Inshallah continuing with our study of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tafsir al-Qur'an We've been covering surah al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Qur'an And in the previous session we talked about the beginning of the section of the surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the creation of Adam alayhi salam. The beginning of the creation of man, of humankind, uh, the story of the Genesis. In this uh, particular session, we're going to be talking about ayah number 34. So in the previous session, we learned about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, saying that I've created him for the purpose of serving my will upon the earth. And at that time, the angels had a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, expressing a bit of their curiosity about the problematic nature of this human being. Yet still, this human being being selected by Allah to serve out the divine will on the earth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the exchange where he taught Adam alayhi salam, um, he presented things before the angels and said, tell me the names of these things. And they were unable to, in spite of how magnificent they are in terms of their creation, they're creatures of light, they are incapable of disobeying Allah, they do exactly as they are told, they never fatigue, they never tire, they never... Uh, wear thin of their obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But at the same time They were not able to acquire and pick up this new knowledge When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the names of these things to Adam alayhi salam And then he said Anbi'uni bi asma'i ha'ula He said inform me of the names of these things Adam alayhi salam was able to recount back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the names of these things. Thereby demonstrating that this human being, in spite of being such a flawed creature, not specifically commenting on Adam alayhi salam because he is a prophet created by the hands of God. So not speaking about him, but speaking about humankind in general. That human beings will be flawed creatures, in spite of that, something very remarkable and dignified. Adam. Something of great, um, remarkable, um, you know, significance and virtue and dignity was demonstrated that this human being has the ability to learn, acquire knowledge, and be able to grow through that particular process. Now after that is demonstrated and illustrated and that point is made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said I know everything that is hidden within the heavens and the earth Nothing, nothing is hidden from Allah And I know what you reveal and what you continue to conceal um, and I kind of commented that Mufassirun say by it saying that continue to conceal, there is a subtle gesture, a subtle allusion to what is coming at this point. And that brings us to ayah number 34. Now, as always, I will read the Arabic of the verse, read the trans translation of the ayah, and then we'll talk about the understanding of the ayah itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ تِسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ The translator writes for this particular ayah, the translator writes for this particular ayah, excuse me, When we told the angels, bow down before Adam, they all bowed, but not Iblis, who refused and was arrogant. He was disobedient. So that's kind of a summarized translation of the ayah, or a summarized explanation of the meaning of the ayah. And now we'll get into the actual discussion, what is typically referred to as the tafsir of the actual ayah. So in doing so, there are a few key terms that I'd like to kind of take the opportunity to explain first. And that'll help 
make the conversation a little bit more coherent rather than getting started and then I have to keep kind of diverting away from the actual discussion on the ayah to detail the meaning of some of these words because there are certain very foundational, fundamental concepts and words that are presented here within this particular ayah and we're being introduced to them for the very first time. First and foremost, we have the concept, we've already been introduced to the angels and malaika, and we had a discussion as to who are the malaika, what is a malak, and what that exactly means. The second concept that we're being introduced here for the very first time now, if you're studying the Qur'an from the very beginning, as we've been trying to do here, from Surah Al-Fatiha into Surah Al-Baqarah, it's the very first time that we're being introduced to the concept of sujood, sujood, or sajda. So I thought that I would take the opportunity to explain it. First and foremost, because it's at the crux of this entire incident, this entire story that we're about to get into, there's a sujood that is at the crux of all of it. All right, And it's a very powerful um, act of worship and even a symbol of faith and obedience and devotion within our religion. The sujood is a very fundamental concept. So I thought that we should understand it properly. First and foremost, a sujood fil lughati al khudu'u wal inhina li man yushad lahu. So linguistically, in in Islamic terminology, in Islamic studies, oftentimes there will be, for especially these very important concepts, the words have a linguistic meaning. There's a linguistic meaning of the word, but then there is a more technical understanding of the concept what that word represents as a concept in Islamic theology, in Islamic philosophy, in Islamic law. And so, linguistically speaking, the word sujood means humility and to show deference to the one that you are doing the sujood before. So if someone does sujood to someone, they are basically humbling themselves before that person or that entity, and they are showing deference to the thing that they are doing sujood towards, linguistically speaking, all right? Literally speaking. However, First and foremost, in Islamic terminology, sujood means to place your face on the ground. To put your face, to touch your face, particularly the forehead area. But now when we do sujood, we know that we touch our nose as well. But that's more of a fiqh issue. That comes a little bit later on in the discussion. But it basically means for your face to make contact with the ground, with, with the earth. Furthermore, was sujoodu lillahi ta'ala ala sabil al-ibadah. Secondly, the second part of the meaning, technically in Islam, is that sajda is done, this putting your face on the ground, is done only and solely for Allah. Number three, ala sabil al-ibadah. Number three, it is an act of worship. It denotes worship, glorification of God. وَلِغَيْرِهِ عَلَى وَجِهِ التَّكْرِيمِ And if, and this is a capital IF, all right, all caps, a giant IF, and I'll get into the explaining, uh, I'll get into the explanation, I'll explain it in just a moment. And if it is ever done, hypothetically speaking, for anyone other than Allah, then it is a gesture of respect and greeting. It is a gesture of respect and welcome and greeting. As... We see in the Qur'an that the angels did it in front of Adam. And the brothers of Yusuf did it in front of the Prophet Yusuf. Alayhi salam. We, that's in the Qur'an, in Surah Yusuf. Alright? فَكَانَ تَحِيَّةً لِلْمُلُوكِ قَدِيمًا Because in the old days, if you, want to, if you entered into someone's company and you wanted to honor them and greet them, and show love and admiration for them, you would basically bow down in front of them. Now that we understand just the meaning of the word itself, now let's talk about this entire concept. So first and foremost, there are a sujood no'an. The scholars have saying, now we're gonna get into a little bit like Islamic philosophy and Islamic theology 
and legality. There are two types of sajdas that we know of in the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is the basis of all of our knowledge, Islamic knowledge, Allam al-Qur'an, right? The angel said, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. We only know what you taught us. And Allah says, Allam al Quran. Allah taught the Quran. So the foundation and the basis of our knowledge is the Quran. And the life of the Prophet is built on top of the Quran. So when we look within the Quran, as sujudina wa'an, we see two types of sajdas. Alright? In the Quran. Number one, sujudu ibadatin wa ta'lihin wa huwa lillahi wahdahu. The first type, number one, is a sajda of worship, a sajda of glorification, deification, identifying someone as a god, okay? And that is for Allah and only Allah. وَهُوَ لِلَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ That is only and solely for Allah. Alright? And now, that sajda that is just done for Allah, that has two manifestations, that has two realities. Number one is, وَضْعُ الْجَبْهَةِ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْمُعْتَادِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ Number one is, when you put your face, your forehead on the ground, as we do within the prayer, then that is the first type. Secondly, وَأَمَّا الْإِنْقِيَادِ وَالْخُدُوعُ لِمُقْتَضَى إِرَادَتِهِ Secondly, there is also a figurative sajda in front of Allah, like a figuratively, it's called the sajda in front of Allah, that Allah talks about in the Qur'an. For instance, in Surah Al-Rahman, Allah says, وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ yasjudan." The stars and the trees are bowing. Obviously, it doesn't mean that they're doing sajdas exactly physically like a human being is doing sajda, because they're not, they're not human beings. They have a different physical reality. But what that means, that the, sad, the stars are doing sajda in front of Allah. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Muslim talks about the sun prostrating before God when it sets. Okay? That is more figurative. And what that means is they are completely subservient, completely 100% obedient to Allah. They completely submit before the will of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا In Surah Al-Ra'ad, Surah number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to Allah alone is submitted everything that is in the heavens and the earth, either willingly or unwillingly. So even the earth is doing such that before Allah. What does that mean? That means that it's completely devoted to the obedience of Allah. And both of these, both of these, whether it's being talked about more physically, like the human being does sajda, or more figuratively, that they are completely at the mercy of God, both of these are only and only for Allah. These are only for Allah. And no urthani. But there is another type of sajda that is talked about in the Quran. And that is sujudu tahiyyatin wa takrimin min ghayri ta'lihin. Sajda that denotes respect, admiration, love, affection, but not deification, not worship, not glorification. You're not that when that person is doing that sajda, they're not glorifying anyone, they're not deifying anyone, they're not calling anyone God, they're not worshiping anyone. It's a gesture of respect and love and affection. And the example of that in the Qur'an is two of those. There are two examples of that in the Qur'an. Number one, the angels doing it in front of Adam at the command of Allah. And number two is Yaqub and his sons, the brothers of Joseph, Yusuf alayhi salam, doing sajda in front of Yusuf alayhi salam. Alright, that's talked about in Surah Yusuf, in the Qur'an, in Surah number 12. And this... So how do we exactly understand this? What is the understanding of this sajda? That's just, that of course, Yaqub is a prophet of Allah. He is a great prophet of God. Israel, Yaqub alayhi salam. So he is, of course, God forbid, God forbid, وَلَعَيَاذُ billah That he's not committing shirk, of course not. But it's a gesture of respect and love for Yusuf. But 
Is that allowed? Is that possible? Can that be done? So the scholars explain that this was something that was allowed rarely and sparingly before the Prophet Muhammad That's why the Prophet Yaqub does it there. That's why Yusuf allows his brothers to do it. But we don't have any other moment where it's ever done. So it also tells you that it wasn't a very, very common thing. Very rarely and sparingly by the permission of Allah. But it was technically allowed before, before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we even see during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu that trees and even a camel one time lowered its head and bowed its head in front of the Prophet sallallahu And that made the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that made them very curious. So they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of God, if these trees mindless trees, and this wild camel, Jamal Sharid, like a runaway camel, this wild camel, and these mindless trees, if they are showing such respect to you, should we not also show you such respect? And the Prophet ﷺ said, La, no. La yambari an yushjada li ahadin illa lillahi rabbil alameen. No sajda is done to anyone in front of anyone for any reason, even if it's for the reason of the love and the affection and the admiration, like the brothers of Joseph did for Joseph. That might have been allowed, but now that's not allowed. From this point on forward, that is only and solely done for Allah, for God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbil Alameen. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade it completely. No such that will ever be done except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, in the hadith, there's a hadith in the uh, Sunan of Ibn Majah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually said, he said, if you want to communicate your love and affection to me, then he said, say salam to me and shake my hand. He said, say salam to me and shake my hand. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us the etiquette. That's why we have that gesture of affection and love and brotherhood is to shake one another's hand. And say salam to each other and greet one another. And the Prophet ﷺ said, smile in the face of your brother. Make dua for one another. Do you understand? And so that is basically the understanding of the sajda. Before I move forward, I wanted to explain two very interesting reflections about sajda. Since we're on the topic, I think it, we would benefit from just two more very fascinating reflections. The first of them is shared by the, uh, a more contemporary scholar who has, of course, passed, uh, Mufti Shafi Uthmani, rahimahullah ta'ala, who wrote a tafsir of the Qur'an, Ma'arif al-Qur'an, and he was a great scholar of fiqh and hadith as well. Um, he shares a very interesting, beautiful reflection that I found very fascinating. He says that if you analyze the salah, if you analyze the salah, there are four main physical postures of the salah. There are four main physical postures in the salah, in the prayer. Number one is standing. Number two is sitting. Like when you sit in tashahud, sitting on your knees. Number three is the ruku'ah, where you're bowing, you're bent at the waist, you're bowing forward, you're leaning forward. Okay? And the fourth is the sujood, sajda, where your face is on the ground. He said, two out of these four, they are very um, common, you know, very, uh, uh, very regular, common postures that are used throughout the course of a day. They are part of living life. Standing and sitting. Standing and sitting. And he said, those two postures being a part of the prayer, they are included within the prayer, but they are primarily useful to people outside of the prayer. And therefore they are completely valid. You can stand anywhere you need to, you can sit down anywhere you want to, anytime you want to, how, you know, wherever you may be, you can stand and sit. But he said then two other postures, ruku'ah, 
We're specifically bowing down in front of something, someone. And then the sujood, putting your face on the ground in front of something, someone. That is exclusive to the salah. That's exclusive to the salah. When is it ordinary to just kind of, except for the purpose of salah, to just go all the way into ruku' and hold that position for 30 seconds? Who does that? That's not an ordinary part of like a normal person's day. Okay? Unless somebody's got some back problems and they're stretching or something like that. But that's not ordinary. I'm talking about ordinary people. Ordinary, normal day, course of daily events. That's not a part of a person's day. Let alone sujood. Sujood is completely out of the norm. And he said, that's why these two postures, they are exclusive to worshiping God. They are exclusive to worshiping Allah. And they are only and solely and ever done only and only for Allah. That's it. We don't do them for anyone or anything else. We only do it for Allah. I thought that was very fascinating, that kind of you know, deconstruction of the salah and kind of organizing thoughts that way. The second reflection that I wanted to share was Imam al-Ghazali rahmahullahu ta'ala Imam al-Ghazali rahmahullahu ta'ala He mentions in his book the Ihya uh, Ihya Ulum al-Din Al-Ihya The Revival of the Islamic Sciences Or the Knowledge of the Religion In that he has a section on prayer salah And he specifically talks about and discusses The reflection and the spiritual kind of Significance of the prayer. Babu Asrar is Salah. Kind of the, the spiritual under kind of like currents and underpinnings of the prayer in the Salah. So in that particular chapter, he says something very beautiful, very powerful. He said the human being is of course kind of three components that Allah talks about in the Quran. There is the jasad, the body. There is the aql, the mind, the intellect. And then there is the ruh, the soul. All right? So he talks about that the physical body is basically to, is either being utilized to serve either the intellect or the soul, the heart, the mind or the heart. They're basically fighting over control of the body, the mind versus the heart. And he talks about the idea that when you're standing up, the mind is above the heart. And that's where you start the prayer, the raka'ah. Halfway through the raka'ah you do ruku' Where the mind and the heart are now at an equal level And by the end of the raka'ah you end up in sujood Where your heart is above your head Your heart's above your head And that's kind of the process That's what you're trying to achieve through the process of salah Is being able to live your life primarily through your heart And then through your head Because the iman has to be put before any other kind of thought process I may have. And so it's very interesting. And there's so much written on the concept and the beauty of the sujood that this discussion can go on for days and days. The last thing that I'll mention here about the sujood, and then we'll move on to the next concept I wanted to introduce. And that is, we already know, because we read the ayah, and we read the translation, we heard the translation of the ayah, that in the ayah, God is commanding, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the angels to do sujood before Adam. So now, how do we understand exactly the sujood of the angels to Adam alayhi salam? In summary, we've already established that this is not a sajda that denotes worship or glorification or deification. But this is a, this is a sajda, a sujood that expresses admiration, respect and affection. Furthermore, some of the scholars say that number one, it was just that, it was an expression of respect and love and admiration as we talked about, number one. Number two, what's very interesting is that Ibn al-Arabi, Qadi Abu Bakr Ibn al-Arabi rahimahullahu ta'ala in his Ahkam al-Quran, the Mufassir of the Quran, the great Maliki scholar, he in his Ahkam al-Quran, he actually also presents another idea that some of the early commentators on the Quran held. And that was, وَإِمَّا اتِّخَاذُهُ قِبْلَةً كَالْإِتِّجَاهِ لِلْكَعْبَةِ وَبَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسُ He says that another idea is that Adam, Allah, when he told them to do sajda, the sajda was still for Allah, and Adam was made their qibla. Adam was made their qibla. 
Like when we do sajda, we're in the direction of the Kaaba, but are we actually doing sajda to the Kaaba? No, we're doing sajda for Allah. But the qibla, the direction of that sajda, physical direction of that, is the Kaaba. Now that of course grants the Kaaba great dignity and respect, but it's not the object of our worship. And so similarly, there's this idea in Baytul Maqdis before the Kaaba, the first Qibla, Masjid Aqsa. So he says, and some of the early commentators on the Qur'an have also said, that Adam could have just been a Qibla, but not the object of the actual sajda. And that's, that's an idea. And he basically says, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Right? That basically he says that the pronoun here is very interesting because you can say, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Meaning, that basically fall down in sajda in that general direction or do it for the sake of Allah. There's a lot of different ideas that can be entertained there. So that's kind of the discussion and the concept of the sajda. Now the next concept I just wanted to introduce here, and this is basically the second one and the, the last concept I wanted to introduce and we'll actually, the ayah pretty much will make sense at that point, but we'll go through it. Um, the second concept of course is or I guess two concepts, is that of the jinn and Iblis. The jinn and Iblis. So first of all, let's talk about the jinn because I'm going to mention it and then it's going to, you know, maybe there's, there'll be some confusion or lack of understanding what I'm talking about. Jinn are another creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ They're a creation of Allah that we don't know a whole lot about. What we basically know about them is what Allah tells us in the Qur'an. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Allah created them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that they are also obligated to live a life of obedience to Allah as human beings are. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I did not create the jinn and the human being except for my worship, my recognition, my devotion, my dedication that that's their objective in life like human beings. Number two, what are, the other things that we know about the jinn is, the, is whatever is told to us by way of the jinn in the Qur'an in places like Surah Al-Jinn. A surah of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Jinn, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the jinn, they heard the Qur'an, they listened to the Qur'an, they believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then they shared some realities of their, of their and their kind with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, some of us are good and some of us are not so good. Some of us believe in God and some of us don't believe in God. Uh, some of us are uh, submissive and righteous, and some of us are disobedient, rebellious, and wretched. So it, it, that's pretty much what we know. There's a whole lot more kind of indulgence that people oftentimes take into the realm of the jinn. But number one, we don't. Mo most of those people don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's all speculation and a lot of time it's built off of folklore and mythology and all types of crazy things. And secondly, it's not healthy. It's just factually, fundamentally not a healthy indulgence. Uh, the other thing we do know about the jinn because we're going to talk about it in just a second through Iblis' own testimony is that he says, خَلَقْتَنِي min nar." We also know that the jinn were created from fire. So there are beings whose essence is fire, like the angels, their essence is light, divine light. Human beings, their essence is this uh, clay, this dust, this mud that, will be, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. But these jinn, their essence is fire. Wallahu ta'ala alam bis sawab. Now, that's the first introduction. Number two is Iblis. Second part of this is Iblis. Now, exactly who is Iblis? What is Iblis? So, there's again two general ideas about the origin of Iblis. The first general idea about the origin of Iblis is that he, Iblis, was an early jinn. He is an early, early jinn. But he is a jinn, he is created from fire. He's a part of that kind of species or creation or whatever you want to call it. But he's that type of creation. He is jinn, creative of fire. Now, how do we, what's the basis of that? Well, the basis of that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al Kahf, Surah number 18, Allah says, Kana min al jinn. Kinda, that's it. 
Allah says, Iblis was a jinn. So we're done. Um, however, however, and there, it's kind of a little bit surprising maybe that how is there a however after that. But there is another idea. This idea, a lot of it comes from what we call the Judaica, the Israeliyat. Uh, you know, kind of discussions and conversations that go back to pre-Islamic times. A lot of discussions from Christians and Jewish um, scholars and tradition um, that they say that uh, Iblis was actually an angel originally. Um, and the basis of saying that is that, well, in this ayah Allah says, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ أُسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ When we told the angels to bow down in front of Adam, they all bowed down instead, uh, except for Iblis. So Allah commanded who to bow down? The angels. And then Allah says, they, angels, bowed down except for Iblis. That kind of makes it seem like Iblis is now being excluded, Mustathna is now being excluded from the group of angels, which would lead one to assume that he was an angel. While that could potentially be one idea, however, first of all, the first thing we look at is, linguistically, are there any other possibilities? So first and foremost, and I'm going to try very, very hard not to get too technical or nerdy, as they say, but grammatically speaking, in the Arabic language, when you exclude, when you make an exception, there are two types of ex ex exceptions, exemptions, two types. One is called al-mustatna al-muttasil, and the other is called al munqati'a all right? So sometimes when you exclude something from a particular group, it belonged to that group. It belonged to that group. So I say, Ja'ar-Rijal, all the men came, illa Abdul Rahman, except for Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman is a man. So he's included within the group. But if I was talking about like the group of people that we have here, and the dominant, let's say that there are 15 men, and there are three or four women, so they're the minority here. And if I say, Ja'ar-Rijal, Illa Fatima. The men came except for Fatima. Obviously, Fatima is not a man. Fatima is a woman. We understand that. The name Fatima is a woman's name. Ja'ar-Rijal ila Maryam. Maryam is a woman's name. We know that. That's a fact. But that statement, while you know, some might find it a bit odd, but in Arabic accommodates for that kind of a statement because in Arabic we have a concept called taghlib. When you have 20 people in a room and 15 of them are men, you may address them as men, gentlemen. Gentlemen, can you please come up here? <coughs> Fatima, can you please stand there? And then they'll be like, wait a second, but you called the gentleman up. Now, where does Fatima enter into the equation? I can say gentlemen because three-fourths of the room is men. In Arabic, I have that. And it would work the other way around as well. So that's the concept that we have in Arabic. So now there's a possibility that sometimes you call on the group based off of the majority of who's present or the significance of who's present. And then you, ex you make an exception afterwards but that exception might belong to a minority or a tertiary group. And then when we do a concept, what's called tafsirul Qur'an bil Qur'an. You don't interpret one verse of the Qur'an on its own. You must look at all related verses of the Qur'an. So Allah is saying in Surah Al-Kahf, in Surah number 18, كَانَ مِنَ jinn. Iblis was a jinn. So that's where we understand that. And we have narrations basically supporting this idea that Iblis was a jinn, but he was a very, very pious, devoted jinn, so much so that he would keep company with the angels. He would keep company with the angels. Secondly, some of the scholars have even gone as far as explaining that 
the, the, Allah commanded all the creation that was present at that time to do sujood before Adam. But Allah addressed the angels because the angels are the most purest of all of Allah's creation. So it's as if Allah is saying that even the angels are being told to bow down in front of Adam. Therefore, everyone else obviously follows suit. That makes sense as well. But nevertheless, I was saying that some, some have said that, well, Iblis could have potentially been an angel earlier. That however, he's quote-unquote a fallen angel, as they say. But the problem with that is that fundamentally would contradict the verses of the Qur'an that basically tell us angels are incapable of quote-unquote falling from grace. They're not capable of disobeying God. So that, that would completely disqualify that theory. And God knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But nevertheless, that is the introduction to Iblis, um, who was a jinn, who was very pious, very righteous, very esteemed in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very close to Allah, so much so that he would keep the company of angels. And that is who Iblis is. So now that we kind of have an introduction to some of the different things that we're going to see here, let's actually look at the ayah and see what, you know, lessons, what, what wisdoms, what fawaid we basically take from the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا adam When we said to the angels, bow down in front of Adam. What's very interesting is that at the beginning of this passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ When your Lord said, Third person. Now Allah is saying with قُلْنَا When we said. We said. And switching from third person to first person in the Arabic language, الْإِلْتِفَاتِ مِنَ الْغَيْبَةِ إِلَى الْمُتَكَلِّمِ is often a way to dignify and to highlight and to emphasize the magnitude of the conversation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is changing His tone through the language to highlight this moment. This is a moment of great honor and respect for Adam alayhi salam and by extension, human beings. Human beings. So Allah is continuing to talk, tell us about how dignified you are in the eyes of Allah. Why do you lower yourself? Why do you disgrace yourself? Why do you humiliate yourself? You are the offspring, you are the progeny, you are the result and the outcome of your forefather, your ancestor, Adam alayhi salam, who was created by the hands of Allah, and then all of the angels were told to bow down in front of him, and they did. Do you understand where you come from? And where are you now? لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقَوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ You started there and you end up down in the dirt? You end up in the mud? You end up in, in the dump? You fall so low? Angels bowed in front of Adam and now you would worship a rock? How, could the, how does that make sense? You would devote yourself to, to something other than Allah? How is that possible? So it's a very powerful moment. وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ السُّدُوا Adam, فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ And they all bowed down the angels because again they don't disobey Allah. إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ Except for shaitan, except for Iblis. And that particular moment, he refused. Allah says, Abba, he refused. Now technically, the word Abba, Abba Ya'ba, it means to refuse. In the Arabic language, it's a verb. And again, I'll try to explain this as you know, plainly as I can. Um, certain verbs in the Arabic language demand and necessitate an object. A maf'ul, an object. This is one of those verbs. If I say, abaytu, I refuse, you would say, what? You refuse what? That doesn't make any sense. I just walk up to you and I'm like, I refuse. What? You refuse what? Okay? You have to explain, you have to qualify that. What do you refuse? Okay, it doesn't make sense by its own, by, by, on its own, by itself. So, it requires an object. Now the obvious object is, Aba as-sujuda. 
He refused to prostrate. But Allah doesn't mention what he refused to do because refusing the command of God is as if you are refusing Allah. If you've refused the command of Allah, you've refused everything. If you reject the command of Allah, you rejected everything. You rejected yourself, you rejected your own reality, you rejected your own purpose, you rejected Allah. You rejected forgiveness, you rejected mercy, you rejected everything good if you reject the command of Allah. And that's why there's a fundamental difference between someone failing to achieve something, being sincere, and just not coming through, failing, shortcomings. لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا Forgetting, messing up. Even though that should be worked on and remedied, but my point is, there's a difference between forgetting and messing up and rejecting. There's a big difference. And that's why to err is human. كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمَ خَطَّى Every, the Prophet ﷺ said, we all make mistakes. Shaitan rejected, Abba, I shall not, I will not, I refuse to. And then he condescended, and he spoke so um, disrespectfully before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you just read it, it sends a chill down your spine. It's quite shocking and scary he says khalaqtani minna ana khayram ana khayrum minhu he says that i am better than him khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahu min teen you created me from fire and you created him from mud from clay in another place he said qala lam akun li asjuda li basharin i shall never ever do the sajjah in front of this human. خَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ مِنْ حَمَئٍ مَسْنُونَ You created him from the stinky mud. Never bow down in front of him. Can you imagine such arrogance before Rabbul Alameen? It's wild, it's bewildering. And this is a little bit of a, kind of a, you know, interesting but technical, a little bit technical, uh, you know, kind of understanding of what Shaitan said. This concept, this kind of idea, this logic, if you want to call it that, this attempt at logic that Shaitan presented, that he, I'm created from fire, he's created from clay, therefore I am better than him. This is basically kind of an exercise that is referred to as Qiyas. Qiyas. Where you basically create a, a premise and then you base a ruling off that premise. Fire is better than clay, and I'm from fire and he's from clay, so therefore I'm better than him. You understand that? Fire is better than clay, I'm from fire, he's from clay, therefore I am better than him. It's called Qiyas. However, the problem is that there's, there's an interesting analysis that the scholars present of this, and that is that this kind of Qiyas is faulty. It's called Fasidul I'tibar. It's a faulty Qiyas. It's not a correct analogy. It's not a correct logic. And it's, his logic was incorrect for three reasons. Number one, even in usul al-fiqh, like in Islamic law, in Islamic legal theory, we have this concept of a qiyas. God said wine is impermissible. Wine is haram, impermissible. The Prophet ﷺ said why? Because it intoxicates. So beer intoxicates as well, therefore it is also impermissible. That's the concept here. Alright? So, but however, we in Islamic legal theory, we have this understanding that you can present your logic, but if your logic goes against a verse of the Quran, or a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it goes against the text, then your logic is rejected. Shaitan, even if we assume his argument for a moment, fire is better than clay, I'm better than him, therefore I won't do sujood. Problem is, God told you to do sujood. He didn't ask you, He told you. He didn't suggest it, He commanded it. So at this point, it doesn't matter who's better than who in whose mind. God said it, so you do it. That's it. Allah commanded it, so now you have to do it. 
That's the concept. That's why his logic is misplaced. Number two, they also say that who said that fire is absolutely better than clay or dirt or dust? Who said? There's a lot of ways to make a whole lot of other arguments. You could also say fire destroys. And the earth builds. So there's a lot of different logic that you can utilize here. Who said that fire is absolutely better? Number three. Number three is that even if, kind of in the concordance approach, even if we assume, okay, we'll give you that. Fire is better than clay. But who said that just because the raw material, one raw material is better than the other raw material, that the product created from both raw materials will still illustrate the superior... If raw material A is actually better than raw material B, who says that the product created from A will always be better than the product created from B? Okay? Somebody says gold is better than silver. Gold is better than silver. Okay? But then you make a toilet out of gold, and you make a ring or a necklace out of silver. Okay? That's it. So that's what you have to understand, that nobody says that just because one, the raw was better than one, then that the result will also be better. And there's a beautiful poem that this Arab poet, he says, إِذَا افْتَخَرْتَ بِآبَائٍ لَهُمْ شَرَفُوا قُلْنَا صَدَقْتَ لَكِنْ بِئْسَ مَا وَلَدُوا إِذَا افْتَخَرْتَ بِآبَائٍ لَهُمْ شَرَفُوا If you are so proud because of who your forefathers were, قُلْنَا صَدَقْتَ We say, you speak the truth, your forefathers were great, وَلَكِنْ بِئْسَ مَا وَلَدُوا But their children are terrible. So who cares? Who cares if your father was great? You're terrible. What difference does it make? Nuh alayhi salam is a prophet. His son perishes in the flood. What difference does it make? And so, that's why shaitan presents this twisted logic, but it's completely rejected. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, was stuck bara. He was arrogant. He was not being logical. He was not being sensible. None of the above. He was being arrogant. He condescended. He was arrogant. And what's really scary is again, it doesn't matter, mention the object of what he was arrogant over. What he thought, what, where, where he was demonstrating his arrogance. Obviously, he, was, he said he's better than Adam, but wastakbara also means he was arrogant in front of Allah. And see, and that's the thing about obedience. That's the thing about compliance. Obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you disobey Allah, it's not just about that particular command. You are disobeying Allah. And that's what's so tragic there. And he became amongst those who disbelieved in Allah. And this is a very interesting concept. How is shaitan a disbeliever? Think about that for a second. How is shaitan a disbeliever? What's typically our definition of disbeliever? Someone who doesn't know who Allah is. Uh, Shaitan doesn't know who Allah is? Shaitan doesn't know who Allah is? Of course, he was there. In front of Allah. In the heavens. In the realm of the unseen. In front of the arsh, the throne of God. Shaitan knows who Allah is. But Allah still calls him a disbeliever. And therein lies the greatest lesson that we can take from this. The greatest lesson that we can take from this. And that is the fact that what this should really, really, um, what this should really ingrain within us and what we should really realize here is that No matter how much one knows, in spite of all the knowledge in the world, in spite of all the experience in the world, in spite of all the accolades and accomplishments and achievements one may have achieved, the objective, the fruit, the result from all of it is humility, submission, and obedience to Allah.
and you can know everything, and you can do everything, and you can achieve everything, and see everything, and hear everything. Been there, done that. And if it doesn't result in humility, submission, and obedience before Allah, it could all be in vain. And there's no better example of that than shaitan. That's a very, very serious thought. I don't want to quite say it's a scary thought, but it is. It's a very, very serious thought and idea that we have to keep in mind and realize. And the last thing that I'll mention here, and I'll conclude with this, the scholar shared this very fascinating lesson uh, from this. It's mentioned uh, in the tafsir of Imam al-Qurtubi, rahmallahu ta'ala, that he says, this is why we should be very careful and cautious, of course, of anointing ourselves, congratulating ourselves, patting ourselves on the back, becoming complacent, being really infatuated, enamored with ourselves. I'm awesome, I'm great, no, no, no. But also we should be very careful about not anointing others either. Somebody does something amazing, that's fine. Congratulate them, make dua for them. May Allah accept, may Allah bless, may Allah reward. You can, they can even inspire you to also do good. But this kind of like idea, and this is a very huge problem in our culture, in our society. We just want to take someone and just put them on a pedestal. We're almost looking for an excuse. Somebody give me a reason. So I can take this person and put them up on a pedestal. And then glorify them. It's a huge problem that we have. And we do it over and over again. Only for that person and for us, for everybody to fall flat on our faces over and over again. Never do that. Never ever do that. Because, as he writes, لِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ بِأَنَّ الْوَاحِدْ مِنَّا وَلِيُّ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ لَا يَصِحُ إِلَّا بَعْدَ الْعِلْمِ بِأَنَّهُ يَمُوتُ مُؤْمِنًا You can't congratulate and anoint and guarantee anything for anyone until they've died and left this world. Until they've died and left this world in a state of iman and faith. وَإِذَا لَمْ, نعلم وإذا لم يعلم أنه يموت مؤمنا None of us can guarantee who will die with iman. Nobody knows. There's a very famous story of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmallahu ta'ala, he's on his deathbed, his son is there, and he's saying, not yet, not yet, and he's trying to console his father, and he says, father, it's okay, it's okay. You're a good man, you lived a good life, it's okay. He said, no, no, I'm not saying not yet, not yet, to the angel of death that I don't want to die. I'm saying it because shaitan was whispering, in my, uh, whispering to me. I felt it in my mind, this thought, this idea, that you know, you escaped the grip of shaitan. You succeeded, you made it, you did it. And I said, not yet, not yet. I'm still alive, I'm still breathing. Nothing's guaranteed. This might be a trap of shaitan trying to get me at the last minute. Which of us can say about somebody else, let alone ourselves, that they are guaranteed paradise, that they are absolutely righteous. لِيَنَّ الْوَلِيَّ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى مَنْ عَلِمَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى مِنْ عِلْمِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى أَنَّهُ لَا يُوَافِي إِلَّا بِالْإِيمَانِ That this can only be confirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the great companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would often time say, مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَسْتَنَّ بِأَحَدٍ فَلْيَسْتَنَّ بِمَنْ قَدْ مَاتْ Because he used to say that if you really do want to look up to someone, you really, really want to admire someone, follow some, in someone's footsteps, follow in someone's path, then do it with people who've already died. Because somebody who's still alive, you don't know how their story ends. Think about a shaitan, where he was, Iblis, where he was, and what he became, the enemy of God. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So I know that we kind of dove in and pretty deep with this particular ayah, but I just wanted to make sure that we're able to understand it. This is such a huge, um, such a significant moment that Allah repeats multiple places throughout the Qur'an. So I thought it would, it would be a benefit for us to discuss in detail. In next section, inshaAllah, then we'll talk about 
now the whole occurrence with Adam and Hawa in paradise and then Shaitan's involvement in the situation and the outcome and the consequences of that. We'll discuss that inshallah in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.